Archive. Hi, I'm Rick Kogan. Yeah, I'm a Kogan. reporter and columnist for the Chicago Tribune. We were supposed to do, and I was very excited some months ago, that the notion of meeting two people who I admire tremendously and meeting in person at one of the Barbara's bookstores, uh, they are the proverbial people who need no introduction. I'm sorry I cannot see you in person. I am actually kind of amazed that I've been able to pull this off with a lot of help, this technological thing. Phil Donahue and Marlo Thomas, who have written what I consider, this book so caught me by surprise, you two. It so caught me by surprise. I thought it was gonna be, oh, let's ask a few questions of some famous people. Each one of these chapters, which focus on a relatively well-known couple, is to me like a great short story. 40 short stories, so, the phone is four so. short stories about love. When you conceived this book, it was kind of, you thought of it as a, well, we're gonna get, what should we do for our 40th wedding anniversary? Should we, you know, go to Spain? Should we buy each other some nice clothes? What should we do? How did this come about? Well, I think, you know, for all of our married life, people have asked us to do articles or a book or something about what our marriage is like and how we put it together. And we always felt that, you know, why would we do such a thing? We're not experts. We're not psychologists. Who are we? And you're also, and you're also and, relatively private people. Given very much so. Yeah, you, very are, much. you are. Yeah. And so we just never wanted to do it. But then we were talking about how to celebrate our 40th. And we said, you know, all these years people have been asking us, wouldn't it be interesting for us to go out and ask a whole lot of people that people know sure. um, that, that are famous and find out what their marriages are like, what, what, what made their marriage last? And we had some ideas about our own marriage, but talking so. to... <laughs> <laughs> and you share some in the book. You're not yeah, looking yes. to share some at all. Before we started... Phil said, I'm not talking about our marriage. And I said, okay. But once we sat down, it really wasn't, we didn't go out like reporters. We went out, a husband and wife, talking to other husbands and wives. And yeah. when we mentioned, even mentioned our marriage and talked about it, the that's when it began to roll. It was fascinating. We, we figured we'd do 20 minutes with right. these. Well, some of them lasted more than two hours. Oh yeah, two three hours. Well, you and, get you get the sentence like from the double, book. It's like a double date, you know. Yeah, we, yeah. We, and we didn't do anybody over the telephone. Everything was person to person in their house. Uh, we traveled all over the country to do it. We even went to Toronto for Elton John and David Furnish. We uh, it, it it was very very personal, <laughs> and because well, we didn't go out as reporters asking specific questions. We sat you down. Had a converse, you had, in the classic way that Mr. Donahue's show used to work and Stud Sterkel used to work, you had a conversation. Right. Basic subject was, hey, what's your married life like? What have you been through? One thing, one chapter that, that intrigued me tremendously because he is Chicago was the chapter on Jesse and Jacqueline Jackson. Uh, especially because you come in and say at the very beginning of it, you write November in Chicago. We should have remembered after all, we lived here for 10 years, but somehow we forgot. You came in on a really we cold day. Get there. It was, the weather was so bad that we couldn't get out. We got to the airport at 8.30 in the morning and we didn't get out till 3.30 in the afternoon. It was such bad weather. Yeah. That one also but, intrigued, go ahead. It also intrigued me too because Phil, you had interviewed Jesse Jackson a number of times on your show. I mean, you that knew true. Yes. You knew him, in, if not intimately, as intimately as you can as a guest host on a show. Right. When, when it gets to the part that everybody knew, you write here, and there's a lot of writing in the book as well as just answers about marriage. The conversation veered into territory that was arguably the most sensitive chapter in the Jackson's 58 year marriage. Those of us in the news business remember that he had an affair and he had a baby. Did You gave her the chance not to talk about it, but she did. Was that stunning to you? 
Yes, we we did not bring it up. She did. I know. I know. Uh, and, uh, once she brought it up, Phil just went with it. I I, I did not. Well, when I, I mean, I was shocked. Uh, you know, I thought I knew Jesse, and and Jackie said when people ask ask us how many children we have. Exactly. I have five. The Reverend has six. It's <laughs> amazing. That yeah, that's one of the that's incredible that's revelations. That's when the you... answer. What's great about Jackie is she is really her own person. <clears throat> she is who she is, and she goes right for it. And I just I fell in love with her. And Jesse yeah. belongs to me. That's right. That's what she said. Uh, yeah, so <laughs> you were thinking about throwing him out of the house, and she said he's not going anywhere. So I just. Uh, I loved her for that. I really admired her for that. But you know, that's the kind of thing that can break up a marriage easily. Break oh, up easily. Well, and there are other things they you believed in their marriage and they stuck with it. And that's what I found interesting about all these couples. They all have long marriages. Otherwise, we wouldn't have been interviewing them. Sure. But what's interesting? They have long marriages for good reason. They yeah. stuck with it. They yeah. wanted that marriage. They went to marriage counseling for it. Many couples, not Jesse and Jackie, but Brian Cranston and Robin Dearden and uh, Al Roker and Deborah Roberts. So many of them went to uh, marriage counselors and I and they really they wanted to make this marriage work. That is, I think, I mean, what more evidence do you want than having your spouse arrange for marriage counseling for both of you? Right. I think sure. that is that is a total act of love. Well, it's an incredible gift to, to the institution of marriage, too, in those specific cases. How well, well it's, so easy, it's so easy to give up. Sure. You know, you get to a place where it's a big challenge, whether it's somebody who was an alcoholic or Jamie Lee Curtis was drug or addicted. Cocaine addict. Was, I'm Kira Cedric and Kevin Bacon lost 30 years of their savings, oh, all no. the savings they had. To Bernie Madoff. Any one of these things could break a marriage up. But these people didn't blame each other. They didn't shy away and run away and look for the exit sign. They stayed with it and made it happen. Who said uh, it's it's more complicated to oh, break Oh, yeah. Up? Elsa Walsh, who's married to the great Bob Woodward, said sure. she said, I understand this impulse for disruption. People put so much <laughs> energy to breaking up when it yeah. would be, yeah. take that energy and put it back in the marriage. But I thought Kira Sedgwick said it so simply. She said, you've got to go into marriage with no plan B. This is it. Yeah. No escape yeah. route, no exit sign. Just go with whatever comes your way. You you go through it together. You get to the other side and you've got something strong that sure. nobody can tear apart. I, I got to get into one thing and I'll be all over the map because there's so many things to talk about in the book, but it was, it made me smile and made my heart jump to learn that Bob Cromey, uh, the host <laughs> of Bookbeat was your matchmaker. And you say about him, Phil, you say Bob Cromey is nobody. He looked nothing like Cupid. A lot of Chicago remember Bob Cromie. I knew him since I was a kid. He co-authored a book with my father. When I saw Bob's name in here, I knew his wife very well too. Uh, I was just charmed by that. Talk about that a little. You went on the show. You obviously, there was some kind of incredible uh, 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 attraction, let me put it that way. And you had complimented Marlo. You had called her at wherever she was staying, the Drake Ambassador East or whatever. And she didn't call you back. And you're Walking down the hall, and she was going to be on Chromie's show. And what you said, well, Bob, he's she won't call me back. He went to do the show, and then he came back to you and said, she has a crush on you too. So I, I give Bob Chromie. Bob Chromie wrote about eighty books. It was very. It was a very high school thing. Well, we yeah. kind of, we flirted for an hour on his show. We met in the oh, green room. Oh, you can no. see some of that flirting on YouTube too. It's still. Yeah. God love, or in your case, God hate YouTube. When you decided to get married, and uh, Phil certainly still had his show, and you had a variety of things going on, was it tough to move to Chicago 
and you were here for almost 10 years. Was that difficult for you? Because that's one of the big things about a marriage is someone sometimes well, had well, Actually, I did not move to Chicago. I commuted to Chicago. Um, oh. Phil was doing his show in Chicago sure. and raising, raising his four boys. Four kids. She, she was in the stage. And I was in LA. Broadway and, and, right, and right. I was in LA at that time and I had a very active production company was doing at least one movie a year that I was in and then other ones that I wasn't in that I was producing. So I was very active and he was very active. So we were commuting back and forth and it was really, was really difficult. At one yeah, point we actually, we actually broke up uh, for a couple of months before we were married, of course. It was just <laughs> yeah, obviously. Yeah. So then when we got married, we went back and forth and back and forth. It was very hard for about five years. And then finally, he did the big thing and moved his show to New York. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, One thing that also both, intrigues me, go ahead. One thing that no, also said, intrigues me is, is how important Chicago has been, Marla, especially in your life. Your father once said he came here uh, with some different name. He was playing a saloon at 5100 North Broadway, and he was so I, embarrassed to be playing a saloon that he changed his name to Danny Thomas and would later right. say that without Chicago, there'd be no Danny Thomas. Nope. This gets to the point where yeah. what, what might have, what did you learn, both of you, from your own parents? I know it's impossible to interview them, but, but I mean, well, actually, uh, we, I think we both learned good and bad. I mean, I, what I learned from my parents were wonderful values. Uh, Christian values. We, we were Catholic and um, a lot about love and loyalty and family. Um, you know, we, we grew up in Beverly Hills, but my, my dad was from Toledo. My husband's from Toledo. Yeah, sure. Mother was from Detroit. So they brought very Midwestern middle class values to our life. And I'm very grateful for that. You know, we did not grow up with parents who were, you know, running around having affairs and getting divorced and all that. We were very stable, go to mass every Sunday, and we went to Catholic school. So we had a, a real good value system. And um, so I learned that from my parents. The other thing I learned from my parents was something that I did not want, which is my mother had given up her career to marry yeah, my father. Yeah, to and so that was something that kept me from wanting to be married because uh, I wasn't sure I could put the two together and I would find a man who would be not threatened by my ambition. So, um, so that was pretty much what I found in my family. And I don't believe it or so not. Danny, are, was, Danny was welcoming to me. I mean, that, yeah, that, for sure. Well, you know, there's no guarantee on that, but it, it was well, he true. Respected you. Well, it was I kind of a, kind of a make room for Phil kind of situation <laughs> well, in a way at our wedding. He, raised his glass he said i haven't lost a daughter i've oh, gained a hundred classic classic so it was around uh, around somewhere in the middle of the reception <laughs> i realized that i had married a hospital <laughs> and when i not? when i would mc uh which i often did uh saint jude dinners i would i get up there and danny would be on the dais seated you know three three seats away. And I would say, you know, people are always comparing me and my father-in-law. We were both born in cities on Lake Erie. I was born in Cleveland. He was born in Toledo. We both married the most beautiful woman in the world. Oh, cute. Yeah. And, and oh, that, that got the ladies with blue hair. Love that. <laughs> and then, then I'd say, uh, and we both, been awarded. We both received many honors. My father-in-law was knighted by two popes. And I was recently named Man of the Year by transvestites for a better America. <laughs> well, the, the, the my, father, my father's head really hit yes. the table. The blue hairs then fell off their, their chairs. Uh, yeah. He, my, and, my dad yes. got a big kick out of Phil's sense of humor. And that he was able to tell a joke the way he did. And 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 I think it brought our whole family together, you know, in a in a wonderful way. And I think when we interviewed these couples, 
uh, people like Billy Crystal and Janice and Arlene and Alan Alda, they worked really hard to keep their families together, even yeah. though they had crazy careers and a lot of traveling. Alan Alda flew back every weekend from L.A. when he was doing MASH to New Jersey to, to keep his children in the school that they wanted to go to. And before he hit it with MASH, he drove a cab I know. in New York City. Yeah. I know. And he would come home to New Jersey at night and put his dollars, whatever it was, on the yeah. kitchen table, and she would sort the money, rent, you know, groceries. That's one of, I, with Alan Alda and his wife and Billy Crystal and his wife, that was one of the things that really warmed my heart is both of those women fell in love and they they understood their husband's aspirations, but right. yeah. with them, I mean, Billy Crystal was what, teaching school or something, right? Yeah, he was making 4,000 a year doing substitute teaching. Yeah, He's yeah, yeah. 10,000 a year. But what's interesting and that you bring it up because they, those wives waited a long time for their husbands to make it, but mm -hmm. they believed in them. And they yes. never said to the, them, as a wife might, why don't you get a real job? They never yeah. did that. They had little yeah. children and everything. So the fact that they believed in their husband's dreams so much really bonded them together. I mean, I think that, I'm sorry. I, no, no, I was just going to say, and uh, Alan flew home on the red eye yeah every friday night yeah right after shooting match right. wow uh joe I mean, biden on the train uh, you know, that's, that's yeah true. <laughs> when you how much research well i have a few questions about setting this up when you sat down and said okay phil or okay marlo who are we going to interview what, what was the you obviously wanted couples that had been together for you know the more than six months, uh, and the longer the better, I assume. Now, our first criteria was over 25 years. Okay. And then we kind of lowered it because we wanted to get some people uh, that would have been married maybe 16, 17 years. Because mm -hmm. we had six, 60 year, the Carters, President Carter's 74 years, the Alders right. are 62 years, Billy Crystal's 50 years, then there's a lot of 40 years and 30 years. And then we thought, you know what, we should get some younger people in here. Sure, and sure. The, even though they're married 18, 19 years, that's still a good length of time. Let's see if there's any difference. So that was one of the things we thought about. And we also wanted to get people from different fields. John yeah, McEnroe sure. from sports and and uh, Sullenberger, the pilot sure. who landed the plane on the Hudson. You know, so one, those two surprised me. Uh, a, a newscaster, Bob Woodward a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist. We wanted to find a lot of different, so that we just didn't end up with actor friends that we had. Yeah, of course. Of, I think that that's a way for everybody to identify, you know, with these different people and their different uh, responsibilities. A lot of Did writers. Did you know, were most of these people, had you known them? I don't think, some you might consider friends. Phil, you interviewed Jesse Jackson 20 times on TV, but were yeah. there who you had no clue about and you just all of a sudden came to you and said that guy Rodney Pete we had never, we had never met uh, Viola Davis we had never sure. never met uh Kira Sedgwick and Kevin Bacon we never met them before huh. um, hardly tight with uh John McEnroe no sure and uh the uh quarterback oh, Rodney, Rodney Pete, Pete. met him before so no a lot of people would we, we'd had a passing you know we had met George Stephanopoulos and Ali Wentworth. Which I've met Al Roker on his show many times. Sure, sure. We never hung out with any of the, those right, people. Right. You know, we hung out with maybe maybe about ten of the couples. We never hung out with Judge Judy, and she was a hoot. And the, the interesting thing about that marriage is they got a divorce after thirteen years. I know. And, I know. And I know. they missed each other so much that they remarried. Uh, and uh, what I thought was really telling about it was she her father had died and she right. felt very alone and she said to her husband J judge judy said to her husband judge jerry you know all my life i've been taking care of everybody now my dad's gone i need somebody to take care of me i need you to take care of me now mm. and he said well what do you mean mm. take care of you carry you from room to room what do you want me to do they got into kind yeah. of a fight about it and they got a divorce wow. and 
after a year, they really missed each other. They started dating again and they re remarried. And I said to her, well, then did he change? Did he start taking care of you the way you wanted? She said, no. <laughs> and, but she said, I grew up and realized. So what's when interesting you is you really can't change somebody. You have to accommodate the differences sure, sure. between you. When you when you approach these people, uh, were they all uh, enthusiastic or were they all a little suspicious or were they all a little, huh? You want to talk to me about what? Or were they, I, I, I get the sense just from the conversations you had them and they had been prepared by then that they were pretty enthusiastic and, and wanted to talk about the subject. Well, we, but we had to talk some of them in. Phil had to really talk Kevin Bacon off the ledge. He He was a little worried about doing it. A lot of the wives wanted to do it, and the husbands weren't sure. Interesting. Um, interesting. Find that interesting. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah. I think women are so in touch with their <laughs> feelings, and they talk to their girlfriends all the time. Men don't really talk to other talk guys. To their bartenders. Yeah, they talk to their bartenders. And Bill yeah. said when we went out, he said to me, "Now I don't want to talk about our marriage." And I said, "Okay." But then once we sat down, it no question. Was, it was a conversation. And no, also, the more we just talked about ours, the more they opened up. Uh, uh, it was, I thought, I thought they'd be twenty minutes. Yeah, and many of them were what? Oh, two, three hours. Yeah, I never thought they'd be twenty minutes. I yeah. figured maybe be a little bit under an hour, but they were all yeah, way, yeah. Lo way long. I also get the sense that they all sort of prepared for you. They would have crackers and maybe wine for you. Yeah. And well, they did. Yeah. Anybody turn anybody turn you down? Yes, the Obamas turned us down and Laura and George Bush. We really wanted them. Yeah. Um, and, well, I had interviewed Laura Bush for another book of mine, which she was wonderful. I really liked her. But I don't think they really wanted to talk about their marriage. Not everybody wants to. It doesn't mean they don't have a good marriage. They just don't want to. Also, uh, she didn't right. want to open. Or to everybody else. Yeah, yeah. Well, that was Michelle. Yeah. Michelle Obama, who's uh, been wonderful to St. Jude, has made a lot of trips to St. Jude, and is a wonderful person. And she was one of the first people that I called, and she said, "I can't do it." She said, "I have everybody that's ever worked for me is writing a book, and I'm not doing any of their interviews. I do your interview, I do everybody else." Which I appreciate. In fact, I just sent her our book to, for her to read. I, I like their marriage, and I like the Bushes' marriage. So I would have liked to have had them. I thought that would have been good. But other than that, we got pretty much everybody that we wanted to get. This is the book again, ladies and gentlemen. If you buy, there's a little thing. You can buy it. You can click here to purchase a copy. I would not know quite how to do that, but you can click. <laughs> Either would wait. Purchase a copy. And the uh, owner of Barbara's tells me that there will be signed book plates in all yes. of the if you buy from Barbara's, which I think is a real, especially given the times we're living in, a wonderfully intimate touch to the whole thing. How many, your book is going to appear, I'm sure it's somewhere online, but it's going to appear on the vaunted New York Times bestseller list this Sunday. Right, we're number six <laughs> on the bestseller list. Uh -huh. Yeah, oh no, I, I, I've heard, you, they tell you, you know, it's online somewhere, but how does it make you feel? You, I, you certainly didn't go into this saying, hey, we need the money and let's try to write a bestseller. I'm so pleased, you know, you've given, I've given my impression and I'll give some more about uh, the depth of this book. That must be very, very gratifying to you too. Who well, it is. Oh, sure. Yeah. It is. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, when you, whenever you do anything, whether you're producing a talk show or a movie or a book or whatever you're doing, you you're doing it to reach people you're doing it to communicate something with right. other people and if they like it if they're getting something from it that's that's heaven that's what you wanted you didn't you didn't write it so nobody would read it yeah. and so everything is word of mouth in this world and one of the things we're missing in this time of, oh. of this pandemic is there's little word of mouth there's yeah. nobody Once. going water cooler and saying oh did you read marlon phil's book there's nobody browsing at a bookstore and saying, yeah. oh yeah, I saw that. There's a lot of the ways in which people buy books. They see them in the in the uh, the window. Of the sure, in the window. Sure, sure. This all is that, all that is. So I'm going to show you another window. This is 
the book. <laughs> this is yeah. the book. But it's also great for you in that, yeah, yes, it's the New York Times. And Phil, I know you've won, you know, 842 Emmys. And Marlo, you have a lot of awards. To your point, uh, Marlo, this is the public talking here. This is the public accepting this book. And I think that kind of thing is, is in many ways a much, much bigger honor than uh, uh, some joker in an office giving you a little prize. You know, one of the interesting, uh, Lily Tomlin and Jane Wagner, uh, I, I was so happy to see them in here because they have not been formally married for any great length of time, but they had been together for an inordinately long amount of time, given, years. frankly, given, years. this isn't real TV, given the shit that they had to put up with to have the life they had. Right, uh, right. Really, and they're, they're both pretty funny too, but you must have wound up, that must have been a pretty revelatory conversation for you guys. Oh, yes. So I've known Jane a hundred years. She did my yeah. free to be special with me. I, I love her and they have a great relationship. And, um, and Elton John and David Furnish and Neil Patrick Harris. Another one, sure. Uh, and they all are people that, um, you know, wanted to make the statement that since this was, uh, I think uh, Elton John said that, that once it became legal yeah. to marry, have a same-sex marriage, he wanted to do it because he wanted to take advantage of it and say to other young people, this is something, you know, that we fought for and you can have. And I think that's really touching. Very. Touching. Yeah, I, I really did too. They were they really really impressed me. So yeah. so did married since 1946, the Carters. Yes. Yeah. Jimmy and Ross Carter. Four years. Yeah, yeah seven, I know. What did you? And that, and that marriage is very alive. They kind of bickered. They they yeah. they they, yeah. Did, they didn't always agree on stuff. Uh, it, it was it was charming to be with him. And you saw that picture first thing in the book. Yes, isn't that fabulous? In his navy whites. He fell in love with yeah. me. I think she fell in love with me because I was dressed in white. It's just there are so many charming things in here. You must have at one point to get into the tech uh, writing uh, style. You you could have at one point just said, "Hey, we're going to have a, a two hundred page book." that is filled with the highlights of the Q and A that you had with this. And the book is peppered with Q and A's, but the writing, the narrative again, turns them to me into short stories about love. How did that, did it happen organically? Or did you say, hey, we just can't have question and answers in here? No, we never consider doing a Q and A. Uh, we didn't want the book to be, uh, the same, you know. Every story is different. Some yeah. stories have more. Some stories have more narrative. Some stories have more dialogue. I never saw them. It's not really a Q and A. It's no. a conversation, you know. And yeah. I and I think that that that's what makes it interesting. We knew uh, together. We really discussed it. This is a part that we should see in dialogue, or this yeah. is a part that's yep. fine to describe. Yep. Um, yes. But when it was either poignant or funny or revealing. That's when we would go to the dialogue. Um, and I, I really, I really love the way we did it. it because I, it, every I, one of them seems differently. They start you, differently. They end differently. Oh, and, no. And then, but I, I couldn't agree with you more. Sorry. What did you do? Did you sit at a big table with two computers and say, honey, what do you think? This part. What do you think about this part? Because it's collaborating is uh, is yeah. A between a man and a woman is one way to ruin a marriage. Uh, in some we had the transcript. You know, we did the uh, uh, the the the, 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 yeah, the sure. interview on tape, of course. And then once we had the transcript, we each had the transcript, and we would circle. You oh, know, what, neat. Yeah, uh, this is what, interesting what, what, to me. Or and you also and. These two people, I never heard of these people. The only people in your book I've never heard of are Chip and Joanna Gaines. And I asked Kate, who you met earlier, I go, who the hell are these people? Uh, you can tell them who we are, but you give, you also give. For someone who might not know who Ray Romano is, you, you have a wonderful way of, of giving uh, biographical detail in a, in a 
sort of pleasant, yeah. non-intrusive way. Yes. Well, well thank you, uh, yes, thank you. A lot of people, of course, know who Ray Romano is from Everybody Loves sure, Raymond. Sure. But it's good to put a little something to just, uh, you know, remind people. It's, it's, it's good to have a little bio bit, you know, not too much, though, so that it gets boring. Um, and Chip and Joanna Gaines are very, very famous. Well, um, not, in, not in this house, but uh, who are they? I know, I know who they are now. They, do a, they did a television show called The Fixer Upper, and mm -hmm. uh, writes cookbooks. In fact, we're number six on the Times uh, Advice and Miscellaneous list, and she's number one. Uh, her cookbook is huge. Um, oh, and they're wonderful people. They're very big supporters of St. Jude, and they come from Waco, Texas, and they completely created Waco, Texas. They're very <laughs> interesting. They have a whole empire. How are you spending your time these days? Except you're doing a ton of interviews. So it's a very nice piece. Yeah. Of 60 and, and we're cooking. We're, yeah. we're slicing and sauteing. My husband is a good slicer. And I, I do the wash. Okay. Uh, the bounce goes in the dry cycle. <laughs> uh, Always learning. Always learning. I also. You know, I'm not proud of this, but I didn't. Both machines. We live in an apartment building, yeah. so our our equipment is stacked. The washer and dryer. The washer and dryer, and I didn't. They both have round windows <laughs> in the front. How the hell am I supposed to know? What, so I have to ask. You know, I'm sorry. Who cooks but, in this household? Yeah. Well, we have a housekeeper who's taken wonderful care of us for thirty years, That's and of great. course, she's not here. She's a uh, self-quarantined in her house and we're self-quarantined here but you know this is a very tragic time for a lot of families oh. people are sick and people are dying and people have lost their jobs i mean there's yeah. this is a horrible time really? but, people but, have, but you know but people have been, lost their minds we, yeah we've been i'm sorry what i said people have lost their minds and are losing That's, their minds yeah but we have uh have been you fortunate to to have this work to do now uh, in promoting our book, and also that we have enjoyed, you know, cooking dinner together. And we ha uh, in our apartment, we each have our own workspace, and that mm -hmm. helps a lot. So that I can be on my computer for several hours by myself, and he can be in his study doing his work. So that that gives us we're not falling all over each other. Which some of our friends who uh, uh, are used to. The one, the, the wife who sure. works out of the home and the husband is a writer. Now that she's working in the home, there's no space for both of them. So it's harder for diff different people, depending on, on how your house is laid out, you know? Let me ask you, I know for a fact, uh, Phil, thanks for letting me call you Phil. You're a news junkie. And I, too, as a newsperiman, I'm a news junkie. I have finally uh, been beaten to death by watching the news. If, if someone were to tweet me and say, hey, turn on TV, they've discovered a vaccine for coronavirus, I would, I would have our two TVs blasting. But right. what do you take from television on this daily basis? It, it seems it's, it's trying to be hopeful, but it's redundant. Well, it certainly is redundant for a person like me who I am a political. Yeah, champion. I know. I know. I, I, I just, I think this, this time, this era, this Trump era, will probably have more books written about it, and I oh, believe this. I do too. Than Lincoln. I yeah. mean, uh, how are we going to explain this to the yet unborn? Yeah. I mean, this is. We got a crotch grabber for a president. How <laughs> did this happen? And I don't think we've given enough thought to that. How did this happen? Instead, we seem to be most of these conversations now or monologues on cable TV, which is where I used to be. And sure. have a, I have an extra curiosity about it. I want to know if they're still talking about me. <laughs> and, uh, and the parents, by the way. So, they should be talking about the book. Yeah, they should be talking, talking about, about anything but one thing. They're talking about 
they're, they're talking too much about Trump. But I, but Phil made a very good point the other day. He said, with all this focus on just Washington, what stories are we not getting? Yeah. And that's a very yeah. important yeah. question. And only yeah. good journalists like Phil would ask that question. What else are we not getting? And One of these we are surprises. getting an awful lot of, of COVID, which we certainly should be getting. And our governor has just been fantastic, Cuomo. He yeah, is really- so is our state together. You know, I, I mean, I really appreciate that. Same here with J.B. Pritzker. One of the surprises in the book was to see uh, Dr. Sanjay Gupta, who not only in the book, but I will tell you, he seems in the last three months to have been on TV a total of more than all of your put together and all of your films put together. He's a right. Guy, uh, could you go to guy? He's, yeah, a, tell he's me. a very sensible, reasonable. He's not a hysteric. He gives you the facts. He's re you know, when somebody tells you the facts, it's very reassuring. And that's what Cuomo has been doing. He's been yeah. giving the facts. He's not been hysterical about it. You know, he said, look, there's this many deaths. We shouldn't be going out yet. He's just, you know, it's, it's very even. And, and, and Sanjay has been doing the same thing. And I think it's very much appreciated. There's a lot of good things in What's the news. Wife, you know, I, I got I it from the chapter in your book. His wife seems delightful. Yes, very. very yeah. Much so. Yeah. I'm going to open this up for some questions. Okay. And here and see what see what the public, see what the public wants to know. Here's a okay. question. Okay. Rose. Uh, Phil, if you still had your talk show. What would you say is, come on, what would you say is the most relevant topic of conversation today? Well, it's, it's uh, you know, as much as I, uh, you know, have to say your eyes begin to glaze over with yeah. so much Trump. But if I had a show, I can't be a hypocrite. I wouldn't, I would have Trump. I mean, I don't, I don't want to be a dead hero. What else yeah. would you uh, well, well, you'd I, have to now concentrate on on the news of the day. You'd have to be all COVID all the time. Uh, but boy, your show, you know, Oprah Winfrey, who had some success on TV, will, will ever thank you in public and in gratitude to you sort of forming, inventing, to my mind, smart conversation on TV. And I, you just don't, you just don't see that that much. I was before we came out and I was, I was goofing around on TV and I stumbled on, on Maury Povich's show. And I thought, oh my God, I had never watched it, never seen it. Uh, I was, uh, I was terrified and frightened. We'll get another question for you two now. Uh, Phil, you've mentioned that jealousy was an issue early in the relationship. How did you overcome this? Well, it wasn't easy. Uh, <laughs> uh, I mean, here I am with, uh, I mean, I walked into the green room and she turned around and wham, you know, it was really, really one of those uh, moments when you think, wow. And I was thrilled for two reasons. One, I knew she was going to be a good guest. She yeah. was smart about contemporary issues, most especially the the women's movement, all the very sure. important to women. And uh, she was a movie star. So, <laughs> and here I am, you know, I, she, she was a hangover guest. As I did, you know she was, did you know she was single? You must have known she was single at that oh, time. Oh, yeah, oh, sure. Oh, I oh, was yeah. famous. Single. Listen to that, famously I single. It's very clear that I was never getting married. So, uh, he what knew was I was. Clear, what was clear in your head about that? I mean, not that Henry Kissinger would have swept somebody off your, their feet. He was smart and everything, but you dated, you dated and, and didn't get married. And did you worry about that? You know, the whole Catholic thing too, is if you're not, if you're I, I never wanted to be married. Not married, you're either a, should be a nun. Yeah, no, Henry Kissinger, I had one dinner with him. That's just well, the, a lot of people took pictures of that dinner too. Oh, yeah. No, uh, he I, spoke well of you. Yes. He's a lovely guy. I mean, I, but, but it was nothing. I had a lot, a lot of nice boyfriends, but but 
I just never wanted to be married. As I said, I, I just didn't think it was for me. It didn't seem like a roomy enough place. And I, I'll tell you the truth of this. I think that for many years, the definition of marriage was very yeah. singular. Yeah. That, yeah. you know, that mommy did this and daddy did this and Jane and the dog spot and all that. And it all looked the same. And I just knew I couldn't fit into that. It wasn't until I got smart and the world changed a little bit too because of the women's That's movement true. that I realized you can define your own marriage. When yeah. we were living, when I was living in LA and he was living in Chicago and we were traveling back and forth when we were married, uh, my I had an aunt who said to me, that's not a marriage. And <laughs> and, it, and it's true. To her, it wasn't. To yeah. us, it was. And well, so it's, a it's a very much a generational kind of thing. Right. Once I'm, you realize you can define it your own way, yeah. that there is no strict definition of what a marriage is, then you then, then you can get into it because then it's roomier. It's sure. a roomier place. Sure. And you're not and you're not burdened with, you know, the previous generation's burdens. I'm going to look at another question. I'm going to show you all the book again. Uh, and thank you. Sign. When are you yeah. signing these book plates? Do they send you a bunch of little things to We've sign? We've been signing them right yeah. here in our <laughs> dining room like mad. Can you open That's that too? Can you open the book to the Carter's picture? It's sure. Uh, hold that sure. up. I want this to be want like this will be the ultimate in Rick Kogan technological wizardry. Watch. Look at that. Is it good? Can you see it perfectly? She was 19 and he was 21. I know. They're such a cute couple. And I mean, he's he's had an estimable, you know, post-presidential run. I'm looking yeah. at the questions. Uh, they read the Bible to each other before they go to sleep at night. I know. That's something I will end up doing, but, you know, it's, it takes whatever it takes. Would you ever do a podcast... This is from Nikki Luanco. Would you ever do a podcast on making a marriage work? We are doing one, well, actually. What yes. is it? Where can people We're find going it? To start doing it in mid June. Fantastic. Uh, based on the book. Uh huh. We are doing that. One of the things that, that I want to make sure and tell people that this is not some, you know, nickel and dime self help book. This book. If you digest the book as a piece of, I'm serious about this, as a piece of literature about 40 different, I hate to keep bringing up these short stories. If you listen to what these people say and you read the way in which it's written and you digest that, you will have answers, but it's not, you know, sort of what should I do if my husband comes home late smelling like perfume? It, yeah, it's right, right. Yeah, it's no, not that, that quick. You have to unlock hit, the secrets. You've hit the nail on the head. It's not a how to book. Exactly. A how to book you could put in a little pamphlet, you know, but this uh -huh. is not that. This is this is 40 different what's. What, what yeah. did they do when this happened? What yep. got them through that? And it, within that are a lot of lessons that we have learned. Sure. I think I think that our marriage is different, don't you? Yeah. I really do. Right. Yeah. And, well, and now we, well you do you have and being uh, your non self your self effacing selves, you know, at the end there's a little epilogue and you kind of kind of get into what you learned about yourselves. It's like three pages, uh, albeit three pages. Right. 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 Question. Thanks for being so patient. I think uh you're patient, articulate, and smart and witty. Uh, which married? Oh, okay. This is not bad. This is again, Nikki. I can't ask two questions from you. Uh, many couples are not getting married until their children are born, or not at all. Uh, how do you feel about that? Uh, I don't know what the. <laughs> I don't think that's my business. I, I really don't. Um... To me, whether however you put your lives together, if you're true to each other, if, you're, your business, yeah. if you respect each other, yeah. you're not hurting anybody else. It's it's, it's none of my business. I don't I don't know. Good, I like that answer. Not the arbiter of what are good answers or votes. Well, you know, this 
funny thing. People get to vote on what they think are good questions. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Marlo, since you interviewed Mariska Hargitay, is it possible, and you were, I, I'm adding to the question, and this is Nikki Luongo again, is it possible you'll be back on Law & Order? You, you were great in Law & Order. Oh, thank you. No, no, I'm not looking to be back on Law & Order. I love her, and I think her husband is great, too. And he said something that I thought was really interesting. Uh, oh, I'm not dodging your question. I, uh, no, no, I'm, I'm, I'm not looking to do it again. But I, I, what, what's interesting, he said that people get married thinking that the person they marry is going to make them happy. He yeah. said, and if you're looking for that, you're going to be disappointed. <laughs> and after a few years, you're going to say to yourself, well, I'm not happy. I'm going to find somebody else to make me yeah, happy. Yeah, he said, and that's yeah. just going to go on and on. He said, because happiness comes from what you build together. Mm. You build something together mm. and that brings you happiness. The other person alone doesn't bring you happiness. You build it together, something you build. And that's why coming through challenges and living through the different things without running for the exit sign, that's where the happiness is. Now, you know that Many times when books hit the New York Times bestseller list, the publisher of that book, in this case, Harper, uh, might be uh, seduced to coming to you and saying, uh, hey, have you two thought about writing a second book about this? I, it, it's, early. it's a little early for that. Yeah, <laughs> wait till it hits the list. Wait till the guys at Harper go, holy cow. <laughs> You know, the what makes a marriage last two? Would you? Uh, I, I think you. Well, what I can't make a marriage last. Yeah, right. <laughs> Why did you get divorced? Yes, we interviewed four divorced couples who hate each exactly. other. I didn't exactly. work. Uh, you two have been just delightful. I, I wonder. Uh, don't forget, you can buy the book. Click this little thing under here, and you can buy it from Barbara's, the venerable, venerable Chicago bookstore. That I know it's quite famous. It is quite famous. It started yeah. in uh, started in Old Town where I grew up, and uh, I used I think I used to go in there looking and seeing if they had Playboy magazines that I could steal. But I I don't. The owner is still the owner. Uh, it, what do you guys think about? It? You guys look fantastic. Uh, Eighty two and eighty four. Your thoughts, just, Stud Circle was a great friend of mine, and Stud's lived to be, you know, 96, and we would often, after he turned, we would, we would often talk about age and how age changes one and changes the way they look at life. Do you have any, do you have any thoughts on that? Or, Rick, you're an idiot, shut up. We don't want to talk about it. I don't, I don't know. I don't think a lot about it. Do you? Yeah. Yeah. No, I don't. Uh I, uh, I obviously, well, I have to say, you know, as you get into the eighties, you know, you start wondering, uh, <laughs> but I, I'm, really not, I'm not possessed by yeah. the one. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just enjoying life and watching the water bug here do nine things at once, uh, <laughs> during the, during the virus and, uh, you know, learning more about her than I ever knew before. And uh, it's good. It's good. It's good to be it, locked it, up. I it, wish this wasn't been, the cause. Yeah, it's been a very interesting time of my life. This is a chapter of my yes. life. No That's question. No question. And I mean, you two are you seem you've expressed, you know, sympathy for all those others out there who are really struggling and are going to struggle. Uh, again, I wish we could have uh, sat at Barbara's together and uh, Hello. shake hands anymore. But this was just a real delight. I'll look and see if there's any other question that someone has here, like, but there may not be. Don't forget, you can click on that little green thing at the bottom of this uh, of this screen, and you can buy the book, and it will be... Uh, it will be, uh, contain a little book plate with both. So we're signing the book plate. Right. And we yeah. we'll, we do house calls. <laughs> That's we're not, dangerous. We're not allowed to leave our apartment. We have to do a virtual yeah. house. 
Right. Yeah, no kidding. Thank you. It's a pleasure meeting Thank you. This you so much. It was the great. Fact that Bob, it it great will fun. always, the fact that Thank Bob Cromie is the one who played matchmaker for you guys is unbelievable. Uh, to me. Thank so you. take good Thank care you so of yourselves. Much. Make a nice yeah. dinner. Thank you for reading the book before you interviewed us. Oh, really I've never, I've never, you know, the worst question in the world, you may get it on some goofy radio show is, so what's your book about? Oh, yeah. Oh, We've had that. That doesn't lead to, hey, what was it like to interview Jesse terrible. Jackson? You never get there. Uh, yeah. It's an absolute pleasure to read the book. The book, I would have read it no matter what it was in order to do this, but the book was a great Thanks. surprise to me. Great surprise. Thank you so much. Thanks very much. My pleasure. Okay. My real pleasure.